Welcome back from lunch and thank you for rejoining the conference. Um, it was a really interesting morning. I'm really looking forward to some of the research sessions this afternoon and it's uh, really great to be with you today from the ONS. Uh, my name is Ellis Monghang. I'm Head of Household Income and Wealth here at ONS and I'll begin by presenting some ONS updates on our work producing inclusive data, cross-cutting analysis and high quality statistics. And then I'll be handing over to two ONS colleagues who I'm really pleased could also join us today to present on some survey developments and recent work looking at administrative data. We hope to have some time for questions at the end. Um, so please pop them into the chat during the presentations and I won't be able to see them while we're presenting. Um, so we'll turn to the questions later towards the end of the session. So in line with the ONS strategy, our focus is to deliver high quality, inclusive statistics. Now, while the macro picture is hugely important for many of our users, for us, this means that our priority is on the distributional analysis and looking at inequalities across people and across places. ONS has a really unique ability to look across topic areas, so a particular focus for me has been on developing our cross-cutting insights, developing analysis that look across income and wealth, or uh, wealth and expenditure, income and expenditure. Um, and I'll share a few examples uh, slightly later in my presentation of some of the analysis that we've done like this. But our third focus is to ensure that the statistics that we deliver remain high quality and inform the evidence base and support policy decisions to direct resources to those most in need. So this means for us embracing developments to our surveys, to methods, to processing systems and to new data sources. I wanted to share just a few highlights from the past year that some of um, some of you may be fully aware of these. Some of you may be a little bit less aware of them because these are often in addition to our core outputs and some might even offer uh, new opportunities for secondary analysis that you might be interested in doing or working with us on. So firstly, we've explored subjective poverty as a topic and added new questions aligned to international best practice to the Opinions and Lifestyle Survey. If you're not familiar with this survey, one of the benefits is the frequency and processing time. It means we can get insights uh, from respondents uh, more quickly than we can by just using our annual surveys alone and really just complement our uh, annual uh, suite of statistics. So we collected some data earlier in the year on subjective poverty. We're currently analysing this data and we hope to publish it in the coming months. We've also been trialling some new high level expenditure questions on the Wealth and Assets Survey as part of our mission that I mentioned to produce these cross cutting topic insights. Uh, we know that uh, users like to uh, understand uh, the income, the expenditure and the wealth of a, of a particular individual or a particular household. So by adding these high level expenditure questions um, onto the survey, we're hoping to unlock some of these cross cutting insights. Between production cycles, we focused um, on improving our pipelines and streamlining our processes, making our systems more efficient and, and higher, and as a result, the data to be higher quality. Um, we're also looking at making them more responsive to changing user needs, uh, to evolving user needs, um, and to making sure that the, the um, systems and processes that we use can deliver the data that you need. Kate um, will share more on this shortly, so I'm not going to talk too much about that. Uh, we continue to work with the Government Statistical Service, particularly with the Department for Work and Pensions, to ensure that our outputs, when combined from both departments, provide users with the information that they need on family finances. And then finally, as well as our regular publications, such as our local level income estimates that we released earlier in the year, we've also worked on a number of cross cutting statistical outputs, aimed particularly at providing insight into the impact of the rising cost of living for UK households. I'm going to talk very briefly about uh, two examples of this analysis. So in spring last year, findings from the Opinions and Lifestyle Survey suggested that renters were on average reporting more difficulty affording their rental payments than the difficulty that mortgage holders were reporting um, experiencing when, uh, when paying for their mortgage payments. So we wanted to unpack this finding a little bit more and try and see if we could understand what was driving renters to report this difficulty. And we used the Living Costs and Food Survey to explore the proportion of income that was spent on rental or mortgage payments as a, to, as a way to help unpick this. 
The analysis showed that for the financial year ending 2022, renters spent about 21% of their, on average, of their weekly disposable income on rent, whereas mortgage holders spent slightly less, 16% of their average weekly disposable income on mortgage payments. This varied a lot uh, by age, by sex, by income, and we uh, we have published a data set that shows all of these breakdowns. But generally, we could see that throughout all of the different breakdowns, renters were spending a higher proportion of their disposable income on rental payments. And therefore, we were able to use this to help explain why renters were therefore more vulnerable uh, to the increases in housing costs. The second chart um, on the slide shows the proportion of households that have sufficient formal financial assets to cover a 25% fall uh, in household employment income for three months. This, uh, this analysis was done using the Wealth and Asset Survey, um, so for the period 2018 to 2020. And on average, we found that almost three quarters of households did have sufficient savings to cover the fall. But actually, when we broke this down, when we looked at different characteristics of the household um, or the household head, the picture was very different. So we found around a third of households where the household head had a limiting disability or long standing illness could cover a 25 percent drop in income. Less than half of renters um, or households where the household head uh, had a routine or semi routine occupation could cover this drop. We've got Lots more breakdowns. There's a few showing on the chart and lots more that can be provided uh, via a link to an Excel document that we published on the ONS website a couple of months ago. But I just wanted to share just in two minutes those brief insights that we that we have seen from our recent surveys. I'm happy to share more detail or answer questions about those. Um, but for now, I'm going to hand over to Kate Pugh. Kate is research lead for the Living Cost and, Fu and Food Survey, and she's going to be talking about her work improving data collection and data processing. Thanks, Alice. Uh, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for having me today to all the hosts. And um, I'm here to talk about uh, Living Cost and Food Survey data collection and processing improvements. Next slide, please, Alice. So topics to be covered today, uh, we're going to look at the LCF record of spending. This work is led by uh, Joanna Bullman, who previously led the, the research branch, um, and we've been using her expertise to uh, delve into the best approach for collecting the diary data. I'll be covering the LCF process in pipeline uplift, which is led by Mila Teneva, whose team of incredible coders have sort of grappled with the LCF systems. Um, and then I'll be looking back on um, my team's work at implementing the pipeline um, and the uplift and how we've grappled with that. Next slide. So this is Joe's work, the LCF record of spending development, previously known as the diary. So next slide, please. So this is just to sort of set the scene. Um, Pre-pandemic collection of detailed spending was recorded by a respondent um, by respondents in a 14 day paper diary. So this is the adult version and on the next page, is the child's version. So this is completed by children aged seven to 15. So this is what was in place pre-pandemic. And then on the next slide, um, we had to move over to an Excel collection, um, which was interviewer led instead. And this sort of overcame some of the barriers to um, the, the pandemic and how we dealt with that. So um, it used to be face-to-face -face, uh, interviewing and then over the pandemic we had to go to telephone methods and use a more digital approach to collect the diaries. So this is currently still in use at the moment. Um, Respondents give the, their expenditure to the interviewers, the interviewers record the data in the spreadsheets and then that's handed over to, to the coding team um, in Titchfield and they code all of the expenditure on a line by line basis. So it's very uh, time consuming and laborious. So next slide, please. So what the team were looking at, the vision statement and objectives of the project for overcoming the barriers or the issues with the collection methods. Uh, we wanted to move away from diary to a record of spending, which I think the interviewers felt was a better reflection of what they were doing in terms of um, collecting the, the receipts and data. Um, and then they're no longer filling in as a diary from a respondent perspective, but more of an interviewer and noting down receipted purchases in a notebook. So that was going to be changeover. Uh, so, so during the 
discovery phase of the development project, uh, pain points were identified, confirming that the current process is not fit for purpose. So there was inefficient collection and coding processes, um, increasing coding time and affecting data quality, increased workload and burdensome process for interviewers, increased risk for case management and data transfer, increased burden on coders due to incomplete and in inaccurate data, and additional training of level of skills required and speed of change. Next slide, please. So the new process, um, we, we use Blaze in-house in, in the ONS and we're moving from um, Blaze 4.8 to Blaze 5 slowly. The, the new diary will be in Blaze 5. Um, so interviewers will enter a unique access code, um, add the respondent household details, complete usual purchases to make it easier for incomplete entries, uh, record non-receipt -rece database expenditure, and upload images and files with receipts, adding missing and unclear information. This will recover the recording spending pattern and then they can check and subject, submit. This goes to the shared drive um, rather than Blaze 4.8, so it's missing out a section there which will improve the processing. Next slide. So this is sort of a view to just see what the new tool looks like. It's sort of getting to the very end of the development at the moment and we're really excited about the prospect of implementing this later in the year. So this is the, the main menu and on the next slide there's a day menu to show uh, for data entry. You press the green button and they upload the receipts and pictures there. Next slide. This is the spending category menu for adults, so as you can see, is quite detailed. It goes into all the various sections of expenditure, sometimes aligning with COICOP, but things like winnings, which is um, a little bit of a different approach. It's usually incoming rather than outgoing expenditure there. Um, OK, and next slide. This is an um, example of a summary page uh, that interviewers can add or edit or delete on spending data, so it's easier to manage than the Excel form. And then next slide. Expected benefits for interviewers are detailed on slide. So this is all to be um, reviewed post implementation, but this is sort of what the feel of the testing gives at the moment. So it's user friendly, um, more tightly controlled case management. So pre-populated fields and automatic saving of cases, which will reduce admin time and free up time to make contact with sample households when more information is needed. Um, Improved data quality within built checks and reduction in survey validation queries, reducing training net requirements. It is quite intuitive. We've had a real uh, good selection of people testing the tool uh, with no prior experience and it is quite intuitive, which is a bonus. And the functionality is being made available on work iPhones so that interviewers can complete it in the field as well. And next slide, please. So for coders, as the data comes in and they're um, coding all of the expenditure. So the usual purchases section and spending pattern information um, will always be completed, which will be a bit of a boon. So it sort of differentiates whether the household typically buys full fat milk or semi-skimmed, or if they like 50-50 bread or wholemeal sliced or unsliced. It just helps get that detail in the data, which we need for some of our customers um, and helps with that um, overall. So the receipt in Images are clearly labelled and consistently and grouped at individual level after upload to Blaze 5. So that helps with if we're doing edit queries or we need to look into the data as it comes further on down the pipeline. Um, weights and measures information, which is used for DEFRA, asked for, speci asked for specifically for non-receipt based expenditure. Sorry, I tripped over the words there. Um, and then we're hoping for better quality images as well, improved data quality within built checks again on the coding side, and then non receipt based expenditure feeding through automatically to Blaze 4.8, which is a smoother part of the process once it comes in. Next slide, please. So user testing and tool development. So we're testing alongside uh, large surveys that operate within the ONS at the moment um, and making sure that the performance doesn't impact both surveys ne negatively because um, it takes quite a lot of um, space to, to run these large surveys. Uh, there'll be a final detailed test of the tool and a data transfer system, um, which will proceed if the performance, performance test is successful. Um, and then to ensure that data entering into the Blaze 5 tool is processed without error following fixes implemented after collection of the operational test. So. This is, these are the next steps we're going to be putting in. And then 
general overarching data quality benefits we're expecting, like I said, reduction in validation time, automation of data transfer. Um, it may allow time of data entry analysis um, to be improved in the recording systems. So sometimes we look at how long it takes to, to complete a case because we know that the burden on the interviewer and the respondent is quite great with the RCF. Um, it forces completion of data points through admin checks. It ideally streamlines interviewer time on data entry, improves the me measurement of benefits over time in the best way possible, and exploration of time and analysis once live in the field is expected as well. Thank you. And so that's the end of the record of spending section. And now I'll go over to the LCF process and pipeline uplift. So Mila's work has been really complicated and you can see on the right hand side, you've kind of got an a flow diagram of how LCF processing works. So we process on a quarterly basis, uh, go into DEFRA and national accounts. And then we, once we do that, we aggregate up for the annual file, which goes on then to external customers outside of ONS. Um, the code and the documentation for each of these modules is hosted in an open GitLab repository and further development on the uplifted data processing pipeline, as well as maintenance activities continue with those with close involvement of the LCF research team. So they're using Python and R software and they're creating a clear structure that separates functionality to extract, transform, transform and load data from calculating derived variables. I like to liken LCF system to an old banger that has been added on to over time. So this uplift has been a real fresh redo from start, smooth, an encumbered pipeline which hasn't been amended over time, which is a huge improvement on how we've been working um, in the past. And we've got Mila's team in place there to support the pipeline as things progress as well. So this is this is a huge improvement for the team. It's it, with the aim to reduce the manual steps in the process, improve quality assurance, improve version control, embed documentation, and make it easier to update and test the system with questionnaire changes as well. So these are all great. And I, I think Mila's team feel that GIF in the bottom corner of uh, or the meme, the code is done, the false, the code is never done. And with changing variables over time, it takes a lot of maintenance as well. Next slide, please. So this is a summary of Mila's team's achievements so far on the uplift work. So we've saved more than 77 working days on the statistical production tasks, reduced the manual intervention in the processing, automated quality assurance reports um, as part of the weighting module with descriptive statistics, visualizations and underlying areas of concern, which helps us when we deliver data to our internal stakeholders. Um, as it says, the, the deliver system, the deliver system is what we use to extract the data from uh, the survey validation team and put it into data sets. Um, so it was reduced from 26,000 to 7,000 variables, which just gives you a bit of an indication of the task that was involved there. Um, and the new system will facilitate future reclassification tasks um, and with the improved version control using GitLab, the auditability of the code um, following reproducible analytical pipelines development best practice, which again is another sort of marker of quality in what we've been doing and trying to be consistent across the organization with these, with these methods. So that's the end of Mila's part and next slide. And last is the work that my team have been doing on the LCF pipeline uplift implementation. Next slide, please. So all of our original scripts were in SPSS and SAS and some in Stata and Excel macros and various bits and pieces. So we're trying, we're getting a cons consistent approach uh, within R and Python now for a lot of our systems. We delivered pipelines for a variety of stakeholders and we engaged with those internal and some external stakeholders throughout the process. Um, the annual processing pipelines have been completely uplifted, which was a huge achievement this year, and this goes to form the micro data files. Um, and then conducted using a like for like approach before further improvements are made. So that means we're doing just a straight uplift to make sure that we can compare the outputs and conduct a robust user acceptance testing when we're implementing the pipelines. And then once we've done that, we start having regular code reviews and collaborations with the pipeline team on where improvements can be made. Next slide, please. 
So the impact, as we've mentioned before, speed of processing has been improved. The annual file creation reduced from one week to half a day, which is incredible. It used to be half a, week, a full week of grappling with SPSS and SAS, and now it's half a day of quite smooth uh, code running, which is great. It allows for more in-depth analysis and outline identification. Um, and again, reviewing and updating checks to be more relevant to improve the data quality. Things like, I think we still had checks for a drink. If it was over five pound, that be <laughs> that would be a lot of money. But we know now in the current climate, you know, we need to improve that outlier uh, identification because there was a lot of hits in that. And then um, on the team, we've we've developed and um, our skills and understanding of both coding systems and our processing system as a whole uh, as part of this as well. I think that's the end for me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kate. I think we'll take question, any questions for you towards the end of all three of the presentations. So we're now going to move on to uh, Andrew's presentation on small area income estimates. Andrew is the lead analyst for all of our work on financial wellbeing as well as local area income estimates over the last year. And I'll pass on to Andrew. OK, thank you very much. Right. I'm going to talk about uh, small area income estimates, um, which is how we can uh, or have produced uh, data on income right at the very local level, which uh, always generates a lot of interest. So next slide, please. Thanks. OK, so what are small area income estimates? So if you click on the uh, next build, yep. They're published every two years by the ONS uh, for the last 20 years. The latest release um, came out last October in respect of uh, financial year ending uh, 2020. They're down to middle super output area level. So to give you an idea, that is roughly the same size as a ward. It typically contains 4,000 households and there are 7,200 in England and Wales. And that's an example, I'll show you more uh, of, of the area. Four measures of income. Um, so we got the total household income, which is grossed. Then we can take off the or have a measure excluding the um, tax. So that's net. Then thirdly, we can equivalize it because households that contain uh, lots of adults are going to have higher incomes than households that contain one adult on its own. So we adjust for that. And finally, we um, take off housing costs or run it without housing costs. So these are the areas that are modelled. Um, so we take it from the DWP Family Resources Survey. That's the dependent variable and we use lots of other information we know about each local area as our covariates. So next slide. Thank you. So lots of interest. Um, since I've been uh, doing this role in the last year and a half, I've had 70 different people externally write in and ask questions about it, even if it's when's the next one coming up or can we go down to this level? Central government, local authorities, academia, commercial, everywhere um, to identify deprived and disadvantaged communities, uh, very topical with the recent cost of living increases and COVID and um, inequalities for levelling up or whatever the department's now going to be called. Next slide. Thanks. Right. So, um, We've now got a, a live demo. This is the yeah, this is what the publication was. This is the main map. So there's a nice interactive map. That's the front of it. Uh, press again, please. Uh, and we've also got a little chart where you can select your own um, postcode and it tells you where you are in comparison with the rest of local authority and the rest of England and Wales. Next slide. Right, OK, so if you press the button once, hopefully it should and just leave it. Yeah, so we're scrolling down to the big interactive map. This is uh, we're putting in a postcode. Uh, 
and its total annual income and it shows you where it is. The darker the blue, the more prosperous it is. And we can zoom out, that's an area in Hempstead, Hertfordshire. Similarly, for net annual income, it's the same situation, um, but incomes are gonna be lower. Then we try another postcode. This is actually a fairly prosperous area on the uh, northwest outskirts of London. And this is an example for net income after housing costs. So we go back to uh, an area near where the uh, um, ONS Newport is. OK, if you click again, we should go on to the next, the rest of the slides. Uh, oh, um, that's it. If you keep perfect. Thank you. Right. And some of the main findings to put them into context, what we found, this is still a few years, but it's out uh, previous, but it's when it's last done. Compared to the previous time, uh, out of the 50 MSOAs, which have the highest uh, incomes, net, net incomes, uh, 47 of them are in London. That has actually gone up from the previous time, 41. Wandsworth, Camden, Kensington and Chelsea, Westminster, if you know London well, you can understand why. In terms of the least prosperous 50, we've got more of a spread across four or five different uh, regions. Next click. Um, in terms of um, uh, extending out to the top decile, the top 10%, um, a lot of them are in London, but it's not quite as London-centric as the top 50, and that's gone down 39 to 34. Um, for Yorkshire and Humber, that's now gone up. Three in 10 uh, are in Yorkshire and Humber, and 27% are in the northeast, and they've both gone up quite a bit from the previous time. Next. On the other hand, uh, Wales and the northwest uh, are featuring less in the um, uh, least prosperous decile than there were before. In fact, if you look at after housing costs, Wales is now 11%, which is what you'd expect on average. Next. So on this, if you click again, thanks, just once. Yeah, we can see that London remains prosperous if we have a dark colour for the most prosperous decile, a light colour for the least prosperous and a middle orange for everything in between. So London, the southeast remains prosperous, southeast perhaps even more so. Click, thanks. Uh, Northeastern Yorkshire and Humber are less well represented in the least prosperous decile than they were, so they've actually got better off or less or well off. And again, on the other hand, Wales, West Midlands and Northwest have become uh, have become better off. Sorry, Northeastern Yorks have become less well off. So we've got an east west sort of split really where the west has got more prosperous and the east has perhaps got less prosperous next and very briefly here's an example of the output at the uh, top of the list in terms of net after housing costs um, a lot of the top 20 they're all in various parts of london with one exception next please and in terms of those with the greatest incomes, uh, we can see a lot are in London, but we've also got a few in northwest, southeast. And if you know the areas, um, particularly if you work in a local authority that covers them, people can be familiar with what they are. These are the approximate ward names. Next. And we've got an analysis, so we've pulled out for each region, the east of England, the two most prosperous, the two least prosperous, the two with the greatest and the two with the least, um, greatest increase and the greatest decrease. And we can produce that for all of the regions. Next. So what do we mean by modelling? 
uh, next. Well, two thirds of MSOAs contain no FRS responses. So we've got a big sample, 15,000. But if you think there's 7,000 MSOAs, most of them are not going to have any sample. And those that do are only going to have one or two. That's not going to be very robust. So what we do, thanks, is we do a model for the whole country and we take the um, uh, FRS responses for each person individual for each household and then we use to model it any information we know about the local uh, about the MSOAs from the census profession percent of professional people proportion of people on benefit all at various age groups house prices gas and electricity use so we put in a number of variables and then we work out, the model says, how much each of these affect income. Do they increase it? Do they decrease it? Is it significant and by how much? And finally, we can put this all together with all this information on the drivers, the coefficients, to predict for all of the MSOAs, whether they had sample or not, what we would expect them to be if we asked everyone <coughs> in all the MSOAs. Uh, we do a few extra stages. We calculate the confidence intervals, so we've got measures of how precise they are. We calibrate it to regional levels so that it equates to what the DWP has produced, lots of stability uh, uh, checking. And when we're happy with it, next slide. Uh, yeah, we, we publish it. So, um, if we've got a lots of different data sources um, that come into it, uh, DWP, the ones in red are the ones we use for the target variable, the FRS. Uh, the ones in blue, and it goes further down the list, are all those that we use as drivers to test benefit claimant counts. Next, please. Uh, Bespoke admin aggregates, the admin based team, Stat Explore, great source from the DWP on uh, where all the benefit holders are. Next. And of course, all these publicly available HMRC, DEC, uh, VOA, council tax bans, and so on. Anything which we think could influence it. The model will sort it out and produce a subset of 12, 13, 14 variables which are used in the model. And uh, more details on the model I can provide if you're interested. Next. So what about the future? Well, um, there's a lot of stakeholder interest, even more so, um, particularly with the ongoing financial pressures. Next, please. Um, a lot of questions to improve the utility of the outputs. We produce mean uh, incomes. The people ask, what about medians? What about tail measures? What about, you know, the how? what's the threshold that 90% are above? What? How many people are below the 60% poverty line? Can we go down to LSOA, lower level? We want to reduce the dependency on surveys. Costs are going up. Um, response rates aren't always being maintained, uh, although as best we can. Um, coherence with Scotland and Northern Ireland, how do we bring them into it? Next. Uh, and then how do we best use this rich seam of ever growing admin data where we've got data down to the individual level? Can we bring that in? At the moment, we do it indirectly as covariates, but can we actually do it directly from those by aggregating them? So we conducted a uh, feasibility study, um, a roadmap to a roadmap to see whether it's possible. And that came out on the 30th of April um, to see whether there's a possibility of producing admin based income statistics uh, as the official statistics. And we did a quantitative comparison of two methods. So we went back to 2017, 18, where we had both available and compared the measures. Uh, how, feasible, how feasibly we could take an admin based approach. Next, please. So um, there were pros and cons with each. So if you click again, thanks. 
we want to use admin data it's the right thing to do we use the rich data scene we can incorporate new data sources as we go along it's got high population coverage we won't have this statistical uncertainty with surveys uh, next one but do we have all the different components? Does it cover the whole country? If there are people that or households that are not covered, that's going to lead to biases. And how do we get around those? So what we found in the next click is that, yeah, 76% of individuals, that's 93% of, of adults, and 99% of occupied addresses were included. So that's very good, but not not perfect um, coverage variables higher proportions of missing in london young people so it's not evenly dispersed um, generally uh, the two measures at mean level are pretty good but there is more of a longer tail the highest incomes are even higher under abis so which is the correct one um, so there's a lot of further work needed and we explain what we would do if we went down that route. Next, please. So that's that's it. Basically, um, the main takeaways are there's high level of interest, identifying local areas of poverty. Um, yeah. Next. Uh, it's very topical. We've got an established model which works very well and produces robust measures. It's worked for well for a, a while. Next. And it makes, can we make use of the broad admin? We do at the moment with covariates. And there is scope to increase the utility and granularity of the estimates. Uh, and we've got ongoing development work to look at admin data to better meet user needs and reduce the dependence on surveys and that's the uh, data if you're interested so thank you very much thank you very much andrew for your whistle stop tour of several publications that you've produced uh, since the last time this group met together for the conference I'm going to stop sharing my slides in a second so that we can see if there are any uh, questions in the chat bar, because I think we've got a couple of minutes uh, where we could spend some time discussing some of the presentations or answering any questions. But I've also just got up on screen a couple of the email addresses for, for the various teams that you've heard today. And do, please do feel free to reach out to us and get in touch if you'd like a longer discussion on any of the topics that we've covered.